Galatians 6 9 says, And let us not be weary in well doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. If we faint not. not. I cannot possibly read the whole of the book of Ruth. Um, it has four chapters, but it's a very significant story. A testimony is always about the story, not just the outcome, uh, not just the event, but the story behind the event is what the testimony is. You can, you can, the, it, the testimonies are never about the headlines. It's usually about the story. You know, you can have any, consider a, a headline that says uh, Tiger Woods become number one in the world or um, somebody won a gold medal in, in a Grand Slam event. Whatever the story is, that, that's just the headline. But the testimony is the, what makes the, glory, the story to be great. The glory of a story is in the events that happened leading up to it. Because anything, almost anything can happen to anybody. But what constitutes how impactful it is to others or the depth and the greatness of the story is actually in the event leading up to it. The writer, the writer of the story of of, um, of the book of Ruth mentions, first of all, talks about a man called Elimelech who moved to um, Moab to start a life because there was famine in Israel, in, in uh, Judah actually, but moves to Moab in search of a better life. So the story starts about a family who moves to Moab in search of a better life, trying to make their lives better and all of that. And so it starts with the mention of Elimelech, which is this man. And the interesting thing is that even though it's the book of rules, the story does not start about the way the story starts it's not about Ruth, it's about Elimelech and how he went to settle in the land of the Moabites with his wife called Naomi and they are two sons just trying to make life better and survive and the book, as the story begins to unfold, we begin to see um, that another character comes up later named Ruth uh, in fact then the book is and ends up being titled the book of Ruth. A family, uh, this family is about a man, his wife, his two sons, who when they get to Moab, the two sons get married, and one of the wives is uh, Orpah, and the other is Ruth. A family who, the whole, talking about this whole family, who had not uh, met, met Ruth yet, as at the time that the story started, but it then unfolds that Ruth becomes the main character and the story, the writer then tells us how Ruth comes into the picture and, and one thing leading to the other. And, uh, and I, I ask myself then reading through the story, why does he give us a background then? I mean, he, he goes back to why they moved to Moab and all of that, he went back to why, what happened, so we can appreciate what God did in Ruth's life. How God turned a life, her life around. So the testimony is in the story. Just like you, uh, under the sound of my voice today, every one of us, our testimony is in our story. Your testimony is in your story. Not just where you are, but what you had to get through what you had to go through to get to where you are. I was listening to a, a, a very renowned speaker called Les Brown, and he was talking about this, and it really got my attention because he was if if he said he said a story, his story. I mean, just a part of 
his life, just something, mentioned something that really resonated with me. He said he got his mother a Cadillac, um, top range, top of the state of the art car. I think it was in the 90s and all of that. And that's what happened. That's, but that's not the story. So you really never appreciate what really led to it until he begins to unfold it and says that one night they were coming back from church while he was a child. Um, and he and his mother, his father was not present. He had left them when he was a baby and it was cold. It was a cold winter night. And they were, they didn't have money to get a taxi or anything. So they were walking home and uh, he could feel like his mother was not really, was, was, was going through, you know, because she was not happy that she's having to put her child through all of this. And then a car passes by who they were trying to wave down to give them a ride. And the car does not even, the not, it's not enough as if it wasn't enough that the person didn't give them a ride the car spilled water from a pothole on the road on both of them in a cold winter night and he said one thing that he said to his mother that night that mama i am going to buy you a cadillac when i grow up and his mother never forgot so when he eventually became successful and bought the mother a car and it was a Cadillac that made her mother so em emotional remembering that night. Now, why did I take time telling you this story? Just because you, it's important to understand that, just to highlight that, the fact that I said he bought his mother a Cadillac does not tell the story. What makes the story impactful? What makes the story, uh, what makes you to be able to relate with the story or with the headline is the story behind it, how, what they went through and what that meant to them. Glory to God. So I am saying this because the glory, just to highlight that the glory of God in your life has a lot to do with your story. <laughs> what you so if you've been through anything, if you've gone through anything, it is that the glory of the story would be greater. I don't know who that who can relate to that under the sound of my voice, but whatever you have gone through is a building block to a great story. It's a building block to a great story. Whatever you've gone through is a building block to your great story that is unfolding in your life. Yeah. Uh, so we're talking about uh, the book of Ruth and, and, and the character, which is Ruth. One thing that I see in the book of Ruth in this book is that the story started with pain but it ended in glory. There had been famine. Elimelech moved to Moab with his family, his wife, Naomi, and he, unfortunately, he died. Uh, eventually, somewhere along the line, I don't know how long that was. And then the focus of this story comes to Naomi, what she has to endure. And Naomi mourned as she mourned her husband and all all the difficulty that came with being a widow, but as if that was not in, enough, his son, first son, as first son dies also. And as if that was not enough, <laughs> a second son also passed away. Both of them having gotten, gotten married to two ladies in Moab. So then Naomi is left with these two women, Opar and Ruth who she does not know what to do with. And this is where the character Ruth begins to emerge in the story. The person in whose name the book would eventually be written. Then we begin to see what's outstanding about Ruth, her resilience. 
a, a, a character who does not give up easily, committed, dedicated, one who keeps going even when she has no reason to go on. Mm. One who picks up herself from every disappointment, who is resilient in the midst of pain, one who doesn't give up easily, even when it does not make sense, she hangs in there until her change comes. And what and, and this is what we take away from this book, from the life of Ruth. Don't give up. No matter the circumstance, do not give up. There's something good ahead of you. <laughs> there is something good coming out of this. No matter what it is, don't give up. You only see that thing though that is coming only if you do not give up. Only if you don't stop going forward. And I'm going to keep reiterating the scripture. Galatians 6, 9. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. If we faint not. So don't stop going forward. Is there anyone... I don't know who's listening to me, who is uh, anyone under the sound of my voice, who will keep going forward no matter how long it takes to get to your dreams. Stop, keep going forward. No matter how many setbacks you've had, <laughs> keep going forward. <laughs> no matter whatever you have gone through, keep going forward. Even when she no longer had a reason to, she keeps going forward. <laughs> Glory to God. You don't need a stronger reason to keep going forward than the fact that there is a God in heaven and that he is able to turn any situation around if we faint not. I mean, her husband is dead. And that's the only rope that ties her to her mother-in-law, Naomi. There is an on top of that, there is no child. She's childless. She has she she just lost her husband. What can be worse? So legally, she's free to go. It was lawful to leave Naomi at this point. She had every ground to quit. She had every reason to quit. But Ruth did not. It doesn't feel good, but she doesn't quit. It doesn't make sense, but she doesn't quit. And what we see in this is the power of persistence, the power of consistency, especially in the midst of uncertainty, because it's easy to hold on and keep going when you know the outcome. <laughs> it's easy to keep going when you know where everything is going to end. But to not know where all of this is going, to not know where things are going to end, to not have an idea where oh, this is all leading up to, but to keep going all the same, <laughs> that is outstanding. That is noteworthy. That is what is uncommon about greatness. That is what's most uncommon factor, actually, that we find in this story. Hmm. Glory to God. What stands out for me in this story is not really about the winning. It's not about success and all of that. That's important. But what stands out for me is the fact that she did not quit. What stands out for me is that she does not quit in the midst of of all of the trials and all the challenges and every obstacle. Because anyone can stay in the game uh, as long as they're winning. Anyone would stay in the game as long as they're winning. There's a kind of winning though that happens because, let me say it like this, there's a kind of winning that happens because you played well, because you had a good game. You had the game under control. You know, you had a wonderful game. But there's a kind of winning that comes from just refusing to quit. 
Not because you had a good game. Not because everything was fine. Not because you've had it all together. But just refusing to quit. Not because everything went perfectly. Not because you've had it all together. Not because you've succeeded in all the moves you've made. Not because you've had everything... Everything you've always wanted to happen that happened at the right time. Is anybody listening to the sound of my voice this morning? Not because you, you've you always had everything fall in place, one thing after the other all the time. But just because you refused to give up. <laughs> I don't know who I'm speaking to, but I am let, I'm here to let you know that there is a blessing ahead of you, there's, there's success ahead of you, there is greatness ahead of you, not because everything has always lined up very well, but because you refuse to give up. There's a victory that comes because you had a good day, but I'm talking about the victory that comes. What we find in this story is the victory that comes as a, re as a result of not quitting as a result of not giving up because of a bad day. No one wins. No one wins because they never had a bad game or a bad day or a season. Winners win because they refuse to quit. <laughs> Hallelujah. So the strength of not quitting sometimes is greater than the strength of winning. Mm. Anyone can keep going as long as they are winning. But losing, yet not quitting, is not for the faint-hearted. It's what separates the men from the boys. <laughs> it's what separates the women, separates the women from the girls. It's one of the true tests of character. Some people get it right the first time. I mean, it's praise God for your life if you're one of those fortunate ones who everything you've always done fell in place. The way you thought it was going to go was how it went. Everything came at the right time when you were 17. You had you had things fall in line as you wanted. When you, you were 23, everything came together as you wanted. You were where you want to be in your 30s. You're where you want to be in your 40s. But not everyone has. Life doesn't always play exactly how we figured it would play out. Some people don't get it right the first time, but some of us have, some of us, and I keep saying, some of us have had to go through something to get to where we are today. You learn more, actually, when you don't get it right, but stay in the game until you get it right. That is the strength of character. <laughs> the person who has failed the most has the most stories to tell. The people who have had many attempts that didn't get it right and eventually got it right have greater lessons to teach than people who got it right the, right the first time. Mm -hmm. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. The people who have made mistakes have more people listening to them than people who have never made mistakes because they, can, they, they know who can relate with where they are because it's not a perfect world. Glory to God. So what we see in this story is not just winning because you got everything right, <laughs> but winning because you refuse to quit. There's a difference between winning because you got it right and winning because you just didn't quit. Glory to God. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what your situation is. I don't know whatever your life, how your life has played out until now. Child of God, you are going to win if you don't quit. You are going to win. Winning, victory is imminent. I'm sorry, victory is imminent as long as you do not quit. Galatians 6 9 again says, And let us not be weary in well doing, for in due season we shall reap if. <laughs> there is an if right there. If we faint not. Hmm. Thank you, Jesus. So, being weary in well doing is never really an issue of discussion if you have always been rewarded properly. If you saw what you expected all the time, if 
if you saw the expected outcome for all your well-doing and good intentions all your life. But I don't know many people, including me, who always got rewarded for their good intentions and everything was always has always been right. They've never been misunderstood. They've never been misinterpreted. And everything has always fallen in place. Being wary and well-doing would not be a discussion for you if you are that kind of person. But we're talking about people who have done, who continue to do what they feel is right. I'm trying to take the right steps and just done everything as honestly, as well-meaning as they could, but it just didn't come out with the same result as they thought. The results have not, I don't know who I'm talking to, maybe there's one or two people whose results are really, are really, really have not matched their ep effort, uh, whose output has really not been a reflection of their input. If you're the one I'm talking to, you are in the right circle, you are in the right place because you have the perfect opportunity, you have the perfect story for God's glory to be revealed. Glory to God. Let us not be well weary in well doing for in due season we shall reap. If, take note of, if we faint not, take note of the word if. If we don't quit. <laughs> if we faint not. If we don't stop. If we don't give up. If, I'm, I keep saying many ifs because it's the if, if keeps coming up. If we keep going forward. If we don't stop. You see, let me tell you something. The way to get to the finishing line of any race at all has never been by going fast. Going fast only determines when you get to the finishing line. Not if you get to the finishing line. Speed only determines when, how quickly you get to the finishing line, but not if you get there or not. What determines if you get there is if you stop or if you don't stop. The only way to get to the finishing line is by not stopping. No matter the speed you're traveling at, the difference between a rushing faucet, that's water is rushing out of, when you put a bucket just by it, and the faucet that's dripping tiny bits of water from time to time, all the time, but keeps dripping consistently, is only a matter of time. They both get full of water. The buckets get gets full in both instances. That one just gets full before the other. And I found out in life, you really can't determine what speed and the speed of your success, the speed of how your story turns out and all the things you've been doing and all the things you've ever done, how they come together to get you to your goals. So the only thing you have control over is your attitude. We don't always have control over our circumstances, but we have what we have control over is our attitude. And what attitude am I talking about today? The attitude of not giving up. You can do that. That is within your reach. That's within your power. That's within your control. Don't give up. Don't ever give up. The only way to get to the finishing line, like I said, is not by is by not stopping. <laughs> you don't know when you're going to get to the finishing line. So we really can't tell that. But at least we know that we're not going to get there if we stop. So what we do, we don't stop. No matter the speed you're traveling at, do not stop. The only reason you won't get to the end of this, <laughs> the only reason you won't get to the end of it is if you stop. Because as long as you keep going, you will get there. You will get there. I need somebody to tell themselves, I will get 
there. I don't know how long it has taken, but you will get there. I don't know what you had to put up with, but you will get there. I don't know what setbacks you had and one thing that has led to the other that has caused a delay here and there, you will get there. I don't know what you've had to sacrifice for others to go ahead of you or for, for, for your family or for your children or for, 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 for your friends or for any reason of whatever it is. I don't know what you've had to, to deal with, but one thing I know, if you don't stop, if we faint not, let us not be weary in well-doing. For it doesn't say, uh, 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 let us not be weary in well-doing. Uh, it doesn't only say that, it doesn't stop there. He says, for we, we shall reap in due season if we faint not. The only condition he puts there is just that we do not stop. Glory to God that we do not stop. Now, this becomes apparent in the next chapter, in the chapter 2, if you read the book of Ruth, because good things began to unfold from the very next chapter. Because if she had quit in the first chapter, she wouldn't have been seeing the blessings that would begin to that began to unfold in the next chapter. When I flip to the chapter two of the book of Ruth, I begin to see things start to happen. Whereas chapter one was a whole one bad story after the other, one disappointment after the other, one loss after the other. And I tell you, children of God, child of God, I don't know who you are listening to the voice of my, to the, to the sound of my voice. You might have had defeats and, and losses and things not adding up, things not coming up right in the previous chapters of your life. But there is a new chapter emerging. <laughs> Glory to God. There would not have been a chapter 2 of the book of Ruth. In fact, there wouldn't have been a book of Ruth at all in the first place if she had quit because of the events of the last of the first chapter. I tell you, children of God, there is nothing that is going to, there is no raw material for God to use for your for your glory of your story if you quit or if you stop going forward. The fact that she didn't quit is the reason that the book of Ruth exists. There would have been nothing notable, nothing to write home about, nothing to mention, nothing worthy of writing in a book if she had ever tried or if she had quit. We would have never, never, ever heard of her. But because she didn't quit, there was a next chapter. I came to let you know, child of God, there is coming a next chapter of your life if you don't quit. This is not the end of your story. This is just the beginning, the making of a whole new series. My goodness, the whole making of a whole new chapter in your life, the next phase coming. Uh, oh, there is a next phase coming. There is a next chapter coming. Uh, and the, there's a next episode coming. Uh, and that is much better than the last one. Your chapter two uh, is better than the chapter one of your life. Oh, glory to God. Your latter will be greater. Greater things are ahead of you. Greater things are coming. Uh, the next chapter is better than the last one. Just do not Quit. Don't quit. Don't give him the towel. Don't throw in the towel. The next chapter is better than the last one. The next chapter is better than the present one. One of the indicators we see close to, uh, at the close of chapter one in uh, the book of Ruth going to chapter two is chapter one closes by saying, and they arrived Judah at the end, at the beginning of the barley harvest and they arrived Judah that's Naomi and Ruth after uh, it was just two of them left and they decided to relocate and go back to Judah they left Moab in pain but they arrived Bethlehem of Judah into the season of 
harvest. They left the last chapter in pain and arrived into the next one in a season of into a season of harvest, into a season of opportunities. I, there are opportunities, child of God, waiting for you in the next chapter if you will just keep going. And you are stepping into new seasons of opportunities. You've left the last chapter behind you with all its pain and all its grief and all the, all the trauma and all you had to go through. But the next chapter of your life offers new opportunities that you didn't see in the previous chapter. Glory to God. They left the last chapter in pain and arrived to the next one in a season of opportunities. That is what is unfolding as, as, as in your life because the Bible says the path of the righteous shines brighter and brighter and brighter until the perfect day. God was still ordering the steps of Ruth and Naomi in the midst of all the pain. They went through pain in Moab and all the all the all the anguish and pain, all that they had to go through, but God was still ordering their steps. They returned to Judah <laughs> and it happened to be in a season that, that put them in a season of opportunity. That put them in the path of opportunity. They did not give up. They made the move. They went forward. <laughs> Glory to God. They did not sit down in self-pity and say, just this is the end of my life. Even though Naomi changed her name to Mara, which means totally opposite of the delight that her name is. It means uh, she's the, uh, bitter waters. That's what it means. But she had Ruth in her life who still saw something good in her, who still wanted to associate with her. And because of that, the... The, the, the decision to go forward and keep going forward begins to position them. Because look at this. This is the context. Ruth is a Moabite. And she has she, now come to Israel, I mean to Judah. She's not, uh, she, she's, she's, she's not an Israelite. She's not one of the, she's not from the tribe of Israel at all. She went to Judah only because of Naomi. And as she begins to walk and settle down to a new life in Judah, first thing you will notice is that they seem to have a different mindset here in Judah. The atmosphere in Judah is different from Moab. Judah, Judah is more of a happy, happier place than Moab. The spirit there is more upbeat and lively. The attitude of the people of Judah is that of gratitude. It's a place full of worshippers of Jehovah God which is, was not the case in, in Moab. Their perspectives in, in Judah is, uh, are different. They have a, a kind of godly view and perspective to things. They related in a different way. There was God at the context of everything happening. There, they greeted each other in a godly way. You see that when Boaz came to his field and his servants arrived on the farm too, verse 4, and says, And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered him also, the Lord bless thee. That was the culture in Judah. <laughs> it, now, it's, an, it's a different culture. It's a different context. And the mindset here is definitely different from Moab. The people here seem to have a mindset and a culture and attitude of gratitude, like I said. And it, it shows in how they relate. So Ruth, begin, now, Ruth has to begin to learn a new culture. She, she's picked herself up. She has a fresh start. She's in a different environment. A Moabite woman, she's just moved to Judah as a foreigner. What a way to start life in a whole new context. She was married, now she's single. I mean, everything is different. She, she wasn't planning of getting married again, but now she's single. And everything is just different. This, is, this was a big deal in their culture. She's expected to be experiencing now exclusion and some form of discrimination. And why? Will she face discrimination? She's from Moab. And that, is, that has a historical stigma to it, being a Moabite. And let me explain that. The people of Judah knew that Moab was a nation that originated from incest. Though through the encounter between Lot and one of his daughters, that the girls got him drunk, um, the girls he had raised in Sodom, who they got him drunk and then had intercourse with him. And that's what 
the child that came out of that was Moab. Even though the, the family of Le Lot had left Sodom at the time, but Sodom had not left the family because the children had did that to their father. And that and that the fact that God would pick someone from that lineage of Moab and include them in the lineage of Jesus Christ is amazing. How God favored Ruth. How God showed her favor. I tell you something. God, in fact, uses people who are considered to be underdogs. Unimportant. Unimpressive. <laughs> from humble beginnings. People who are outcasts. People who people are, who have been written off. God uses people who have been written off from man's perspective it's amazing how God included, includes them in his plan for their generation. And they are the ones that God uses, the, the rejected, the despised people of this world. He uses all, God uses all of these events, such as famine, Naomi's relocation to Moab, their return to Bethlehem to reveal his plan and purpose. God uses all these events to ensure that Ruth could be part of his plan. Plan. She gets incorporated and included in the tribe of Judah, despite all that has happened to her. My goodness. Her inclusion in Judah came because of her disappointment in Moab. Hmm. My goodness. Now, it's interesting. It's another thing to say it came uh, in spite or despite what happened in Moab. But her inclusion in the tribe of Judah, in the lineage of Jesus Christ, happened because, and that is the word that changes everything, because of the disappointment that had happened. Because if, she had, if this hadn't happened, she, if her husband had not died, she would never have had to move to, to Moab, to, to Judah. And if this hadn't happened, that wouldn't have happened. One thing led to the other. Judah would have been impossible. What happened in Judah would have been impossible without the disappointment in Moab. <laughs> God has something greater in store for you than anything you have ever seen in your past. And when God begins to, when, as God uses those things, he will continually use those things to push you further into your purpose and into his plan for your life. And at the end, it seems like all of that was in his toolkit, in his toolkit, and they were instruments, they have been instruments of God's glory. The transition and relocation to Judah is a significant part of this story. It was a turning point because we see that though they couldn't undo the past, they, 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 they decided to embrace a new future. <laughs> they created a new future for themselves by, by their attitude. By a, uh, an, uh, an attitude that never gives up or that doesn't quit and just continues going forward. Irrespective. Though they couldn't change the past, they created a new future. No matter how rough and difficult the past may have been, you still have a great future. There's a great future ahead of you, child of God. Your future is great. Your latter, you are just entering into the, big, into the best years of your life. <laughs> the best moments of God's glory being revealed in your life are just starting. <laughs> glory to God. As difficult as the past might have been, you can't change it. The only thing you have control over is the future. We have no control over yesterday. Tomorrow is imminent. It will surely arrive. The only thing we have control over is our attitude. The toolkit for tomorrow is our attitude today. The best decision they made was to create their tomorrow, even though they couldn't undo their yesterday. No matter how much they started, they kept going. And they started to rewrite the next chapter of their life. They must have thought, we don't know what we're going to get here when we go over there, but you know what? We're here. We don't know how we got here. We're here. We're just going to have to keep on going. We're just going to have to go on. They came back to Judah and begin life afresh. Ruth started a new job. 
you know, to begin to glean in the fields of Boaz. She's picking up remnants of the, of the harvest because there has been a law in Leviticus that God asks Israelites when they reap their crops, they should intentionally leave some behind and not reap everything. Don't harvest everything. Leave some of it for the poor. And that was what Boaz and his men did. But God granted Ruth's favor that Boaz told Ruth. He told his servants to make sure they leave intentionally more than they would normally leave behind for Ruth. And God granted her speed. <laughs> she was just a casual worker who could be working on anyone's field, but just happened to be working on Boaz's field at the time that Boaz came around and God orchestrated everything. And this was a harvest season. I tell you, this spider has come. The Bible says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy is coming in the morning. God is orchestrating things in your favor and the only way you are going to see it is if you don't stop but keep going forward keep going forward pardon me i'm almost finished but let me read verse 11 and boaz answered and said to her it has been fully reported to me when when boaz eventually met with saw ruth and she asked which dancer is this and they told her who it was and ruth is i'm skipping many parts of this story and ruth is surprised like wow uh, how come this man favors me? Listen to what Boaz says in verse 11. Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully reported to me. It has come to my knowledge all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and came to a people whom you did not know before. The Lord repay your work and fully reward and um, a full reward be given to you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come. For refuge. So all her good work hadn't gone unnoticed. That scripture again says, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Her not being weary in well-doing was not a waste after all. I want to let you know, child of God, nothing good you have done has gone unnoticed by God all your life. Nothing good you've done has gone unnoticed. And I, I'm, 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 I have to close this. I'm running to the end of it. And in verse 14, he invited, he invites her and uh, for dinner and everything. And one thing leads to other, and they are married. They've actually, he actually married Ruth. And let me tell you what this means in God's plan. Uh, Ruth's association with Boaz. She's stepping into the lineage of Jesus Christ, even though she is a Gentile from Moab. This is when we see that God still had a plan for her life despite all she's been through. God uses imperfect people and imperfect situations to bring his will to pass. First of all, Boaz, this Boaz we're talking about, I think had a perfect history in his family too. Boaz is the grandson of Rahab, the, the prostitute. And Ruth, on the other hand, is a Moabite, a Gentile. So, Boaz, a harlot's grandson, and Ruth, a Gentile, are both included in the tree that produced David. Because the son they eventually had, his name was Obed. That's Boaz and Ruth. Obed gives birth to Jesse, and Jesse gives birth to David. So, a harlot's grandson and a total Gentile, Gentile, God brought them together who had a rough past into the lineage of Jesus Christ. Before we begin to think our situations have, have to be perfect for our lives and our lives have to be perfect before, before God can bring something good out of it. God can recycle any mess that we give and lay up at his feet into a glorious story. That's what I want you to know. And make the mess look like it was necessary. It was the necessary ingredient for the revealing of the glory. When we consider a story like this, we see how God makes something out of something beautiful, something great out of nothing, out of total nothing. And the message for now is this: that I that I bring out of this, God is bringing something good out of this. 
God is bringing something good out of your life. God is bringing something good out of your situation. God is bringing something good out of your family. God is bringing something good out of your story. God is bringing something good out of your life. Don't give up. It's never too late. The glory that of the latter shall be greater than the former. God has something greater in stock than your past. No matter what you've been through, the best is yet to come. Like I said, the only way you're not going to get to the finishing line is if you stop. Speed only determines how quickly you get there or not. It doesn't determine if you get there or not. It's nothing to do with speed and how quick. It's what determines if you get there or not is if you don't, well, if you stop and give up or you don't stop. Glory to God. I have a little video of a, of a race between a, I just remember now, a, a race between a rabbit and a, and a turtle. And yeah, one turtle is who, they had tracks for them. The rabbit will run a little bit and get distracted and look around and get some food and go back again. They didn't know they were in a race, they're animals. But the turtles just keeps going. Slow and slow and steady, but it just keeps going. It's slow, it's steady, it keeps going. But at the end of the day, the tortoise got there and the rabbit never got there. Out of the two of them, who has the greater speed? Is the, is the rabbit, we all know. But what got the tortoise there is the consistency. It is the consistency. The, it, it did not faint. It didn't stop. It didn't give up. No matter what, it just kept going. Galatians 6, 9 again, as a close says, let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap. But then, he says, if we faint not. 